Now, I was raised by a family who worked. What an honor to be with all of you today. It's so great to be with all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, CPAC. What an honor to be with all of you today. It's so great to be with all of you. Thank you for being true patriots and for loving America. You know me. You've met me before, and you know my background and my history. I'm a farmer. I'm a rancher from South Dakota who is now blessed to be the 33rd governor of the great state of South Dakota. Now, I was raised by a family who worked very hard. They solved problems. They believed in personal responsibility and not sitting around and waiting for the government to be the answer. I still love the outdoors, and most of the time, working in the dirt and being comfortable in my jeans and wearing a ball cap, but as governor, my hours are often filled with something very different these days. I'm here today to let you know that 2024 should not be a year where we get hung up on party politics, where one issue disagreements, or picking our leaders based on how long they've been in the U.S. Senate, or how many speeches they give each year. This election, the choice is clear. There are two kinds of people in this country right now. There are people who love America, and there are those who hate America. Those who hate America are working every day to destroy it. And let's be clear, Joe Biden is destroying America and taking away your freedoms. We can't just sit around complaining about it anymore. We need to do more. You know, I was recently asked an interesting question by a group that I had the chance to speak to. It was a leadership class, and they asked me a question from the audience and said, Governor Noem, how do you make your hard decisions? And I thought about it for a minute, and then I just said, you know what? It isn't hard. It's easy, because I know the foundation that I need to start from with every single decision that I make as governor. I went on to tell them a little bit about how when I first started to run for governor of our state, it was clear that it was going to be a very different race than I had ever run before. It was showing up in my polling that it was going to be an issue that I was a woman. Now, South Dakota had seen women lead before, of course, in business and in our state legislature and in Congress, but we had never had a female governor before. We'd never had a woman as the CEO of our state. It was a new idea. Now, I had spent my entire life in a man's world. I loved my dad. He was my best friend. I spent my days in the tractor, chasing cows, going on hunting trips with him. I was usually one of the very few women driving semis, hauling grain, showing up at farm policy meetings, serving in leadership in our state legislature. And even during my time in Congress, I was one of just a couple of women on the leadership team making decisions on policy there. It was normal for me to be one of the few women in the world, in the room, and it was nothing out of the ordinary. But I remember the day that I was actually being sworn in to office as the first female governor of South Dakota. And much of that ceremony that day was dedicated to the historical nature of that event. I was being sworn in to office on the 100th anniversary of women getting the right to vote in our state for the first time. And as the ceremony went on and the speakers continued to point out the significance of this 100-year anniversary and me taking the oath of office, it really started to hit me. For the first time, I thought to myself, wow, this is kind of a big deal. I looked around the Capitol Rotunda and I saw it filled with hundreds and hundreds of people. But for the first time, I started to notice all of the little girls in the room and all the women. And I realized that this really was going to be a part of history. They were getting to see somebody who looked like them take on a very different role. For the first time, I started to get nervous. And I thought to myself, I better not screw this up. As I stepped up to be sworn in by our Chief Justice of our Supreme Court, placed my hand on my dad's Bible, and I raised my right hand, I realized that I was only making two promises to the people of South Dakota. I was promising to uphold the Constitution of the great state of South Dakota, and to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. Two promises. I can do that. So from that moment on, every decision that I make starts with asking the questions, is this constitutional? Do I have this authority as governor? What authority do I not have? What is the responsibility of the people? I think all of you know a little bit about the decisions that I've made as governor of our state. The last several years, we saw government leaders in other states use fear to control people. 
They used fear to promote their agenda, their agenda of socialism and control. Now, that has not been our story in South Dakota. They took away, in other places, people's freedom of assembly. They took away their freedom of religion and their freedom of speech. And now, they are threatening our state's rights to protect our people. Now, I was the only governor in this country who never once closed a single business. I never mandated anything to my people. I never told anyone that they couldn't go to church. We were the only state to turn down the elevated unemployment benefits because our people wanted to work. We trusted each other, and we got through our challenges together. And we are stronger because of it. Today, South Dakota is thriving. Because of the decisions that we've made in South Dakota, we broke the record for the lowest state unemployment rate in the history of America at 1.8%. We have unprecedented population growth, historic revenues, a AAA credit rating, a fully funded pension system, and we have paid off debts. We were the first state to eliminate fees for concealed carry permits in South Dakota, and we'll even pay for your federal background check. When the federal government tried to push the central bank digital currency, we were the first state in the nation to veto that bill and to say, no way, not here. We have built roads, bridges, dams, and even a railroad. Who builds railroads anymore? South Dakota does. We do. We put high-speed internet access across the entire state. We have the highest birth rate in the nation. People have hope. People are having babies, and I love it. We do not have an income tax. We have no personal property tax. And last year, we passed the largest tax cut in our state's history by lowering our sales tax to 4.2%. Now, we are one of the few states whose suicide rates and our mental health challenges are going down. And we have the lowest drop in overdoses the last couple of years as well. What does all this say? This says that our people are happier. And they're happier because they're free. Leadership matters. I'm just going to say it. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they suck. <laughs> and you know, to be honest with you, we shouldn't look to Congress for the answers either. The gridlock on Capitol Hill is not going to break in time to save America. We need a president who will. And I have always believed and supported the fact that our next president needs to be President Trump. We have incredible threats to our country right now. Two years ago, I was at the southern border. I was actually the first governor to deploy National Guard troops down to the southern border to protect our country. Now other states are following our lead, and they're sending their National Guard as well. And make no mistake, an invasion of our country is happening, and our border is a war zone. It is the fault of Joe Biden and his violation of federal law. I was alarmed recently to hear Democrats encouraging Biden to federalize the National Guard under Title X in order to take them away from the control of governors and take away my ability to be their commander-in-chief of the National Guard. I recognized immediately the danger in this threat. If the president took that action to remove me as commander-in-chief of my South Dakota National Guard, it would be the first time in American history that a president paid soldiers to stand down, to not protect our country. So I went to the border the very next day. I offered to bring razor wire there so Texas would know that South Dakota stands with them, and I would load it in my truck and bring it. And I wanted them to know that we will defend our state's rights to protect our people and to protect them from a corrupt federal government. When I came home, I gave a joint address to my legislative session, and that very day our state legislature passed a resolution in support of securing our border and standing with Texas. South Dakota was the very first state legislature to, in this nation to take such an aggressive action, and I am so proud of them for doing that.
This week, I announced that we will be deploying National Guard soldiers to the border for the fifth time. This time, they will be constructing a wall, a barrier. A barrier to keep those who want to come to this country illegally out and to stop them from trafficking drugs, from proliferating the sex trafficking of our women and our children, and to stop the inhumanity of Joe Biden's border policies. Now, we have cartel presence right in our state of South Dakota because of that open border. My people are affected by it every day. I will do all I can in South Dakota to bring back peace and stability where Joe Biden has brought destruction and death. We know that China is taking advantage of the situation, that they're funneling military-aged men into our country, and many dangerous criminals and terrorists from other countries who hate us are making their way here, too. Some countries are emptying out their prisons and their mental health institutions to send their responsibilities to us to handle. These countries are infiltrating us to destroy us, and they're doing it from the inside. Now, I saw this coming. I was the first governor in the country to ban TikTok for state government devices. I know how China is using that app to collect our, collect our data, to spy on our people, and to manipulate our opinions and our ideas. Since then, dozens of states and even the federal government followed my lead and took action. Apparently, Joe Biden gets a pass for his campaign, but whatever, Joe. We need to face the facts. Joe Biden is not fit to be president. And Kamala is no backup plan. <laughs> they have facilitated communist policies, socialist programs into our American democracy. It is not the government's job to simply do everything for people. It is the job of the government to empower people to do things for themselves. <laughs> so we have a clear choice. I was one of the first people to endorse Donald J. Trump to be our next president. Last year, when everyone was asking me if I was going to consider running for president, I said, no. Why would you run for president if you can't win? <laughs> I didn't say that to be nice. I said it because it was a fact. No one at, we knew could beat Donald J. Trump. We've known that for over a year, that he's the only person who had the support to be the Republican nominee. So why did all these other people and candidates get into the race? For themselves? For personal benefit? For a spotlight for a period of time? But it did not and it does not strengthen our country if conservatives are not united enough to recognize that we need to win. We need a fighter. We need someone who doesn't give up, who has never quit on us, so don't you quit on him. President Trump, President Trump, he, he broke politics in 2016. He just did. And I think that's a good thing, because he's real. He's not perfect, none of us are, but he cares about you. And what I love about him the most is that he doesn't think he's better than you. So luckily, we are not going back to the good old days of the Romneys and the Cheneys and... <laughs> the Republican Party is much bigger than that now. We are filled with blue-collar workers, many cultures, perspectives, and viewpoints. But most importantly, we all love America. And we realize what a gift that this country is. This country is the greatest experiment in humankind. And if we lose it on our watch, where will we go? Where is there another country that is better or offers us more opportunity? It just doesn't exist. So for me, there is no going back. I'm all in. And you need to be, too. We need to look for our leaders outside of the swamp. Nobody turns to D.C. for the solutions. Nothing meaningful gets accomplished here. It is governors who have had to lead. And I have seen governors make bad decisions and devastate their states. And we have seen governors who did the right thing. Now, as you know, for me personally, I slammed my foot on the gas. I promoted freedom, personal responsibility in our Constitution. And today, South Dakotans are happy. They're making more money. They're making decisions for their children's education. They're pursuing the American dream in safe communities. 
There's a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher where she said, God needs no faint hearts for his ambassadors. Well, with your help, we can always do more. If America wants to be great again, I'd suggest you take a look at South Dakota and see all that we have achieved, and then vote for President Trump. I want to thank you for your dedication to freedom. You are inspirational. I want you to leave here and go be hopeful and be happy. May God bless you, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you. And you know my background and my history. I'm a farmer. I'm a rancher from South Dakota who is now... What an honor to be with all of you today. It's so great to be with all of you. I had a woman as the CEO of our state. It was a new idea. Now, I had now blessed to be the 33rd governor of the great state of South Dakota. This election, the choice is clear. There are two kinds of people in this country right now. Now, I was raised by a family who worked in the legislature and in Congress, but we had never had a female governor before. We'd never view. Thank you for being true patriots and for loving America. You know me. You've met me before of our state. It was clear that it was going to be a very different race than I had ever run before. As governor, my hours are often filled with something very different these days. I can't just sit around complaining about it anymore. We need to do more. You know, as recently... Time working in the dirt and being comfortable in my jeans and wearing a ball cap, but as governor. I went on to tell them a little bit about how when I first started to run for governor,